So the next panel here, we're talking about responsible lending to SMEs. Um, my name's Kieran Parker from Addison's Lawyers, and on the panel we have Leo Tyndall, who's the CEO and founder of Market Lend, uh, Jens Volacek, who's the founder of SpotCap, uh, Boyd Peterson, the CEO and founder of Big Stone, and Aris Alagos, who's the CEO and founder of Moolah. And I think to talk about um, the online lender's perspective of responsible uh, SME lending. You, could, you couldn't find a more qualified panel, so I'm looking forward to this. Uh, albeit that I think if we look at Shane Elliott's um, uh, diversity targets for the industry, we're probably not kicking too many goals up here. Um, gentlemen, firstly, a short, sharp intro to your businesses before we jump into it. Sure, my name's Leo Tyndall. Uh, Market Lens started in December 2014. Uh, we have a real motto of called secured and insured. Our main focus is that we do business lending, which is either mainly driven on working capital facilities or line of credit, which is in majority insured. Uh, we have insurance against the actual credit risk. And we to date have 13.3 million of loans funded and approximately about 325 businesses that we funded. Hello, my name is Jens Volochak. I'm the CEO and founder of SpotCap. Um, SpotCap is a um, provider of short-term business loans to SMEs. We are operating in five countries, uh, three in uh, Europe, being Netherlands, Spain and the United Kingdom, and two here in the region, Australia, and uh, recently also in New Zealand. Um, headquarter is in Berlin, live for two and a half years, and since then we have um, issued around 100 million in, in credit lines and employ globally around 90 people. I'm Boyd Peterson, the CEO and founder of uh, Big Stone. We started lending six, seven months ago. Uh, we were in development for about two and a half years before that. Um, we focus on simple, fast, and fair loans uh, to small businesses and ensure that investors get repaid. We're a marketplace lender. And uh, yeah, Aris, as you mentioned, our founder of Moolah, uh, we're also a small business lending platform. And I guess, I guess just to sort of highlight where perhaps we differentiate ourselves, albeit yeah, similar models amongst um, the group here. Very much, um, yeah, sort of, we feel like led a bit of a charge with respect to how we utilise accounting APIs um, and how we analyse and underwrite through the data we receive from that information in addition to the more traditional forms. Um, and to that end, um, to that end of, you know, priced ourselves and represented ourselves to the market for, you know, almost three years now, um, through what we think is a you know, fair and reasonable cost predicated through the underwriting that we've built over that period of time. Thanks, guys. So let's start by setting the scene um, with the federal government's Carnell inquiry. The report was, re was released early this month. It's very timely for this discussion. It doesn't mince words when it states that there is a complete asymmetry of power in the relationship between banks and SME borrowers. The report found that there have been, or there are, 17 inquiries or reviews since the credit crunch, the GFC. And, and I quote, despite borrowers and stakeholders persistently raising the same issues, the banking industry has taken little action. This sounds like a pretty happy hunting ground for you guys. Um, but when we think about responsible lending, let's just start with a very simple question. Who are you guys responsible to? I'll answer to start with. I mean, firstly, obviously, we are responsible to our investors. Uh, we are a marketplace lender, so we have an obligation to ensure that they, I suppose you would say, keep the losses to a minimum and they get the best return on their capital. Um, at the same time, there is a responsibility back to the borrower. I sort of see it in this way, is that if we're not careful with the way that we look at their ability to repay, well then we can't expect to have a good performing loan. So unfortunately a lot of small business lenders do have rosy coloured glasses at times and they will have a very good view, they would say, about how they think the business is going to go. Whereas what we'll look at it and we'll say to them that, okay, on a certain basis we think a certain amount and a certain risk profile and return is what would be most suitable to you. Um, because we are uh, doing supply chain as well as debtor finance, we do look and see their business on a regular basis through the way their cash flows operate. So we'll monitor it regularly. And then also, in addition to that, we only pay suppliers 
Um, on the invoice finance, it's a little bit different, but we only pay suppliers in the supply chain. And so we do see that we are responsible to make sure that we make it clear to them that that's the way our product operates so that they don't get confused and pay for fees that they'll never even use. Yeah, Jens, you want to give us the European yeah. uh, perspective? Yeah. I mean, we are a direct lender. So in the first instance, we are responsible for the SMEs, the borrowers, um, that we don't overcharge them, that we don't provide them with too much capital, which they cannot serve in the end. Uh, eventually, obviously, uh, as a business, right, you need to also um, make some money. You need to make um, the risk costs um, kind of at a certain level that uh, also your investors, which are then obviously more institutional investors, are also happy. Um, however, uh, being responsible with regard to lenders is very central for us. We are operating in multiple jurisdictions, and each of them are regulated in a different way. Um, but being uh, operational in the UK in particular obviously makes us uh, being compliant with regard to the, lend the responsible lending practices of the FCA. So we are fully FCA um, compliant and have uh, decided to roll that out also across all our countries where we operate, including Australia and New Zealand, which uh, means also that some sort of um, consumer protection, so to say, so which applies also to sole traders, is also very important for us, being transparent with regard to the rates, not making any financial promotions which are uh, uh, have any hidden, um, yeah, unclear um, yeah, incentives for, for, for us or for any other party. And um, yeah, that's, that's very important for us. And um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I Boyd, your comment to me was interesting. You, you sort of start from the point of view that the industry is, as a whole has a responsibility um, to build traction and, and gain success. You want to speak about that? I, I think all of us are in the business to be able to ensure small businesses get access to capital because the way the banking system has been set up globally is failing small businesses. Um, those that in Australia, 90% of um, employers that aren't banks or government are small businesses. They create 50% of the jobs and certainly will create 50% of the next set of jobs. And uh, if you're a very young person, younger than me, who doesn't have real estate collateral, it's pretty hard to get a loan other than from Rebecca. And you can get one from Rebecca for $50,000 if you've been a good customer of the bank for a very long period of time. So what does that mean? It means that allocation of capital done by the banks is, is, uh, is poorly al allocated in the economy. And it's our job to be able to, to, be able to fix that, whether that be through risk-based pricing like we do and all of my, I think the peers here do, um, but also um, finding new ways to be able to utilize security that the small businesses don't even know they have, like cloud-based accounting. Thank you. And Aris, from Mulder's point of view, um, what does responsible lending look like? What's the ethos? Yeah, well, I think, I think Beck, again, to highlight what you said on the last panel, yeah, we all come from yeah, backgrounds where we've you know, had roles prior to founding our respective platforms. Um, you know, I was, I was in the banking industry for about 15 years, and, and if there's anything I learned, particularly going through the GFC, is that you know, the sustainability of your platform is much more important than just a quick bump in balance sheet. You know, we're not about, you know, our ethos is not about, you know, going from zero to 100 million in, in LUM in the space of 12 months, which, let's face it, we could have done that a long time ago if that was our desire where effectively you're not doing an underwrite and you're lending to all and sundry. You know, the challenge for us is to, be, be, to build a sustainable business that can last through, you know, multiple economic cycles that also treats, you know, the customer's fairly um, and with respect such that you know, responsibility really to hone into the point means ultimately just telling them what it is the cost of borrowing is. As simple as that. You know, people appreciate there's a, you know, there's a spectrum of risk and then prices that are called to those risks. They just need to know it. Um, so yeah, it's, the, it's the sustainability factor but also just the transparency that really drives through what we do every day at Moolah. Well, let's, um, we'll come back to the what happens in the downturn, but let's stay on this point and, and dig a little bit deeper into it's like borrowers' ability to repay. I mean, how important is that to take a view? How do you communicate that? Um, w what about information asymmetry in that process? Well, I mean, serviceability is the overarching premise of our underwrite. You know, if someone cannot service a loan, and there are multiple reasons why they can't, i.e., you know, their top line revenue is obviously the mo most basic, but digging further into that, and again, the benefit of doing a more holistic underwrite enables you to look into the detail. So, yeah, if there's leverage on the balance sheet, if there's ATO arrears, if there's you know, a lot of 
a, a lot of ind indicative features that effectively suggest they can't service alone, you don't lend. Um, so in terms of information asymmetry, you know, we would hope there is none to the extent that you know, it's binary. You can either lend because they can service or you can't. I think, the, um, I think there's a recent World Bank report about the um, uh, global credit gap for small businesses, $3.2 trillion. Uh, the number one problem in that uh, report that was said was obviously financial services and the way capital is set up and also the cost of compliance, but the number two problem was information asymmetry. Uh, Cloud-based accounting goes a long way to help with that, but that can be lied to as well. Um, and so I think you often find that it's really hard to separate the wheat from the chaff. And I think from our job as lenders, it's uh, who ultimately secure our funds from investors, whether they be direct on our balance sheet or uh, through a market, um, we need to make sure that uh, the borrower can repay with reasonable certainty, even under volatile circumstances. And for us, um, with our product being an unsecured business um, credit line, it's most important to look at cash flows. So there's no collateral behind that we can rely on, which means that um, obviously it's um, it's not about the, the history and traditional um, data you're going to look at, but we look at bank account data last 12, 18 months and real-time business performance. So we can directly identify how much a even quite young and uh, um, so a relatively small business does generate on a monthly basis and how much they can actually afford to repay. We also tend to explain it to them uh, and it of often helps because they always come to us initially and asking for way, mo way more than they can actually afford and that's actually something very important also to educate them especially as we are not providing 5 or 10 year loans but rather 12, 18 months. Um, and that's in the end also very important um, for, for us and them and for the entire industry. Um, and yeah. Is this a, this is a common observation that it's the, the demand for the loan is often it, it exceeds your comfort zone? Definitely. I, I think one of the things, and the guys have already spoke about this, is that the access of information is so much better than it's been in the past. I mean, seeing someone's bank statements essentially is them just clicking a button, you know, essentially seeing their profit and loss or their accountings again and clicking a button. What I suppose we see, and I presume my fellow colleagues see this, is that when we see an application at the very beginning, they'll sort of explain to us what they want, and then when we start to dig through and we look what other loans they may have, if they have them, or we look, start to look at their debt service cover ratio, you do get to a stage where you sort of say to them, well, look, that's not going to work. And it's pushed back to the sales team to sort of deal with that. The common issue for us will be that there's no use putting someone into a loan that they just can't pay. You may not suffer straight away, but you know, 12 months down the track, next thing you know, they're going under and you can't do anything about it. Leo, are you gonna, are you gonna um, be concerned if you see one of Boyd's loans on a potential customer's balance sheet? Sorry? Are you, are you gonna be concerned if you see a, a, one of Boyd's loans on their balance sheet? We, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. If we see not just Boyd's, but Spotcap and Moolah's loans on the balance sheet, it's a red flag. Um, my head of risk uh, recently showed me one where someone had five SME lenders on there and they had this story that they were doing this, that and the other thing. Look, for us, it's not just seeing the loan, but then also having a look at their bank statement and seeing what the direct debits are on that bank statement. One of the difficulties I think with, we have with business lending is the repayment methodology is different for different lenders. So you get some lenders who will be charging P&I on a monthly basis, some are charging P&I on a daily basis. So the cash flow gets affected significantly. And so what you sort of do is you go through the certain stages and when we get to that point where our risk guys, that we had to actually employ one person whose main role is to analyse the bank statements and then not just take out what we can get from our systems but have a look at and then compare to what loans they have. I must say that if we do see certain providers, and I must say they're not on this panel, um, on the loan, it's a, it's a red flag for us as to why are they lending from these people. I mean, for us it's not per se a red flag. Obviously we take into account anything, uh, whether it's factoring... Uh, secured loans from a bank or even uh, from alternative lenders, how they're called. It's, um, as, as you said before, it's, it's about how much is left basically for the special purpose. Um, and um, something which also interesting here and there is that they approach us and say, okay, um, yeah, um, we started with one player and then the other and 
we kind of we made our first experience and now we want to actually try out what what your offer is about right so i think some sort of transparency overall in the market uh, why are aggregators maybe even uh, stimulated somehow also by the authorities definitely makes sense also to avoid a situation where um, borrowers actually are uh, exposed to many different lenders uh, and then eventually might collapse and that in, in the end doesn't help the industry as well. Um, so it's not only us re being responsible for borrowers but also to a certain extent to the industry because any damage there uh, obviously is a damage for everyone. Let's switch gears and it might seem like an unusual question to pose your panel talking about responsible lending but whatever happened to caveat emptor? Whatever happened to buyer beware here? Um, when I consider the regulatory environment, you've got um, you know, unfair contracts laws being extended to small businesses. Generally, they're being extended to small business lending specifically. Um, to what extent do borrowers need to take responsibility for their own business decisions? Aris, do you want to handle that one? Yeah, I mean, funnily enough, I don't think yeah, Cavity Emptor, um, I'll say that with my best Latin accent, um, is something that's, that's necessarily, you know, operating in small business lending land right now. Um, yeah, to the extent, well, I should say it is, not it isn't, it is to the extent that, you know, there aren't any regulations with respect to misleading and deceptive uh, contracts. You know, contracts are being put out there to lenders that effectively, you know, do nothing to provide any protection to them in this category. So, you know, it's safe to say it's, you know, it's alive and, and strong. Now, the reality is, in light of, you know, to the point about fostering a, a longer uh, or a better and stronger industry and looking out for any instances that might bring us all down, you know, there should be an extent of, of um, support for the category and for the consumers. Um, it isn't something that I think uh, is appropriate in an environment where there are so many people obfuscating the true cost of borrowing just to benefit a very short-term return. Return and and yeah, the reason the reason we have regulation, whether it be imposed or whether it be self-regulation, is to ultimately you know, foster a, a, a better industry. Gentlemen, any other comments on buyer beware? Um, yeah, I think it's going to be a really hard um, battle on this one. I think the regulators, whether it be through Kate Carnell or others, are going to create a lot more transparency. Um, but I think it's up to us on the industry to be able to create a little bit more comparability if we don't want to be uh, regulated with a stronger fist. Um, and I, I do think that uh, Kate Carnell's got a lot to say about, about, the, about the banks, but I think that um, it won't be long before she turns her eyes to other our segment. Mm. I think a little bit different is that it goes to the categories of the type of borrower as well. Yeah. We, we do have the sole trader, we have the partnership and we have the company. The difficulty is with the company is that there is company legislation out there. I think it's very difficult for the government to ever think about legislating the way that borrowing should be to the company because the, the fallback position would be if any of them sat in the court and they said to the judge, oh, look, this is a horrible rate I'm paying, the judge would say, well, you're a businessman, you're in a company, you knew what you were doing at the time. The sole trader is the tricky one because the sole trader a lot of times becomes probably a quasi-personal loan that they've been given. And this is a bit of a grey line that's always going to be a little bit of an issue. But, you know, there's, it's classic is that a lender can lend at a certain rate and if the borrower sits there, takes on the loan, gets given all the documents and it's disclosed to it and then tries to scream later that they say that, oh, sorry, I shouldn't have paid that rate. If they're sitting in their own home or something similar, they may argue that point. The other problem, and I brought this up with you earlier, is that by the time things go bad, most of our borrowers have left. They're, you know, the liquidators in, they're gone. And so they're not complaining anymore. They're out of the picture. So this is a little bit of a difficulty that we have. And then the other thing that I would say is that it's great to have this concept of self-regulating if everyone joins. And the biggest danger we'll get, we'll regulate and we'll be the good guys. Then there'll be a bunch of five bad guys who will just take all the market share for the time being until it all blows up. All right, I've got a question from the floor here. Um, maybe, Jens, we'll start with you. This one just cuts to the chase. What's the gross, a gross APR range for your borrowers and what's the expected net return to investors? I mean, we do. <laughs> you might want to you might want to pause before jumping straight into that one. 
I mean, we don't have a, a net return to our investors because we are not a marketplace. So obviously, we have our own net revenue margin, which we wanna, which we wanna have, and we do risk-based pricing. Yeah, so we are um, charging interest on a monthly basis, starting from 0.5 percent, going all the way up to two to three percent. Obviously, for the lower quality clients, in the end, it's um, it's kind of a bit similar to what you have for for credit cards, um, but it can be also in uh, like below 20 percent for sure. Um, that's what we charge. All right, and we've got another question here. I think we pretty much answered this one. That was more about stacking. Um, all right, let's, um, let's switch gears again. Um, let's talk about enforcement. So one of the um, recommendations that came out of the Carnell Inquiry was the establishment of a cheap, fast, alternate dispute resolution process without lawyers. I've got to say, as a lawyer, this, this is a frightening, dystopian future that she paints. But is this really what the industry, like lenders and borrowers, needs? Or what, what really needs to be done when borrowers default and there's disputes? I'll jump in quickly on that one. And I think we've been, we've been around a little while longer than some and I think we've seen our fair share of defaults now, unfortunately. Um, what I'll say to that is, you know, as a lender, you sort of live and die by your collections. Um, the nature of the category we operate in is one that people go into arrears all the time. Um, they go into arrears for all sorts of random reasons, more so than in the personal lend because you're a PAYG guy and you sort of bubble along with your salary. Um, to that end, you, know, you should be able to manage your collections and your defaults internally to, to an extent such that you really mitigate needing to go to any third party arbitration or going to lawyers. Like it really is the last resort if you are going into a, into a legal battlefield and it's very much because you're being challenged, or there's you know there's some real you know significant issue. So so to that end, you know those sorts of recommendations from the ombudsman probably don't really relate to businesses like us because you know we should have the internal processes to cater for them otherwise. Boyd, yeah, I think um, in many respects those uh, recommendations come around uh, material adverse consequences clauses that are in most of our contracts, but also in the bank's contracts and enable um, those uh, over longer term loans to step in in the middle of a loan, even if it's being paid. Um, and that uh, the biggest complaints of that is actually the deterioration of the quality of the security or real estate. Um, we haven't seen that for 30 years here in Australia, but uh, we will see it again. Um, and I think that um, the reason for those is to be able to enable a, a more inexpensive way to be able to solve that kind of problem of restructuring a loan um, when real estate's involved. Jens? Yeah, I mean, for us, it's, it's uh, I can just confirm what has been said before, it's kind of the last resort. We actually try to be quite flexible and also a, a trusted partner to the SMEs, not only in good times, but also bad times. So assuming that they are, you know, um, being, being open and transparent about their situation, we actually try to, yeah, let's call it in a positive way, restructure loans also for a longer period. Um, because in the end, it's not about enforcing um, certain um, securities or assets, because as I said, right, we have the unsecured business line, there's not so much uh, to expect then, and it's a, it's a, it's a very time-consuming process. So in the end, we are doing actually very well of, of uh, let's say, restructuring and curing most of the overdue uh, amounts, uh, resulting in very low non-performing loan ratios, and uh, continue to do so. So one final question, Lee, I'll start with you. Um, if there's one measure or reform that you would like to see every single industry player adopt, what would it be? Comparative pricing. I think if there was a requirement for everyone to provide a comparative pricing, that would be attractive across the market. Because what we do see is borrowers really don't have any understanding of exactly how much they're paying. They'll get told different numbers and then they'll tell you, I mean, I had a classic one, I won't say the name of the company, they told me that they were paying 3% per annum. The first thing I worried about was how my client actually was managing his business when he thought he was paying 3% per annum. And I said to him, swap rates are higher than that. But then reality was, funnily enough, six months later as he came back to us and said, well, that wasn't really the rate I was paying. I think comparative pricing is something that would be very easily implemented and, you know, the ACCC definitely could monitor it. It's something that I would say is stops any misleading deceptive conduct. Um, it is something that arguably would be something that self-regulation could come into play where those who don't put it would scare, you know, their customers would be able to say, well, look, you haven't told me what the comparative pricing is, so therefore I don't go with you. So I definitely think that would be the great thing. But that's something we could implement. You don't need legislation for that. 
Jens? I can, I mean, there are two ways uh, or two things, I mean, but transparency on, on rates is definitely one of the top two things. I so, somewhat also looking at the UK and, uh, and, and Europe overall, I think there are some very high level light and fair regulation might help to give guidelines. Uh, in the end, it's not about forcing the active players to do something which uh, is just not not appropriate, but um, that might in the end also help to, to foster an environment where everyone has to do basically or apply the same kind of level of transparency and doesn't um, basically fall apart behind um, some more dishonest players. Um, Lloyd, are you nodding? Um, well, I agree with both of those things. I think comparative pricing would be great, but I also think that the government could do a lot more about making data available to um, alternative lenders, set a level playing field. Okay. Aris? I think everyone's spoken words of wisdom. Yeah. Okay. David? Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen.